um, I, I don't know, are we, are we starting or are we waiting for some more folks to show up? Or I'm not We're sure. actually going to get started, I think. And yeah, sorry. I can stop and start over. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. For, for, for um, um, getting all the information together, that's probably a good idea because I wasn't clear that we were starting. But I, I am ready. Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to um, the monthly First Thursdays at the Law Library. And we're excited tonight to have a special guest who is celebrating a little bit of their 40th anniversary with us tonight. Before we get started, I would like to give a shout out to our law librarian, um, Stephen Richards, who came aboard um, just a few months ago, and we've already seen some exciting changes. One, we have revived um, the lawyers in the law library um, on Zoom. Our next date for that is July 28th. So for those of you who have an interest in a free consultation with an attorney, may I invite you to our website, take a look at this, and there are some brief instructions about how you might get registered. In addition to bringing back lawyers in the library, Stephen has hired staff. We are now back up to what was our previous full staffing um, pre-COVID. We have also opened the law library up to five days a week now. Monday through Thursdays, we're open 9 to 6 p.m., and we are open now on Fridays, 10 to 1 p.m. I'd like to encourage everyone who has an opportunity to stop by, meet our new staff, our new law librarian, and congratulate them on what is already turning out to be an outstanding year. We're grateful to have them all. We appreciate their efforts, and this program would not be happening tonight without our law librarian. Thank you so much, Stephen, and I'd like to now talk a little bit about our program tonight and how this is actually an offshoot of some of the commentary we heard from clients who utilized lawyers in the library. This program is over five years old now, and you should note that our previous law librarian and Stephen continuing in her seat take close attention and time to identify the kind of questions that come up in lawyers in the library. They're not always specifically about the law or just about a legal question. Part of the reason that First Thursdays in the Law Library came about was a realization that a good many of our clients were coming with questions that could be at best answered with a referral. That referral might better come to life if we actually invited some of the providers of services. If you were with us last month, you had an opportunity to listen to virtually every head of parts of the probation department. Um, Mr. Washington invited supervisors from a variety of areas, and that has actually been recorded and is available now on YouTube. But what we've discovered through these programs is that there are many services here in Marin County and tonight, Marin and Sonoma County, that people could benefit directly from knowing about. Tonight, we're lucky enough to have um, a pretty wonderful person who joins us from the um, Conservation Corps of the North Bay. That is Anastasia Pryor. And as you learn more about the program tonight, I'd like you to keep in mind that this wonderful individual gives of herself generously and has served both counties and communities for over 20 years. It's significant to think about that depth of involvement in our community as you learn about what this program does. I mentioned earlier that they were sharing a little bit of their 40th anniversary. Understand that this program has changed the lives of a good many people. Not only young people um, that are currently involved in it, but stop and think of the idea of 40 years of this kind of outreach in our community. We're lucky in the sense that this organization, which works to develop youth and conserve natural resources for a strong, sustainable community, was founded all the way back in 1982 as the very first local conservation corps. 
this organization, and at some point we're going to give in and we're probably going to use some initials, so get used to hearing CCNB. But right now we'll still call it the Conservation Corps of North Bay. Works with what we're calling Opportunity Youth, many of whom have been gang involved to help them explore environmental career pathways, as well as gain a broader understanding of their impact on the environment and on their communities. This organization has helped nearly 10,000 young men and women break the cycle of poverty through both education and job skills. And this has been done while serving the environment and community in the conservation services. Located right here in Northern California, this organization has provided service not only to the environment, but to community organizations right here in Marin and Sonoma. I'm going to take a no moment to bring this circle a little bit closer. For those of you who are familiar with the Marin Community Health Hub, they have a Thursday food bank on Redwood Boulevard from noon to 3.30. Keep in mind this is outside. It's not always the best of weather. I can attest to that. It can be hot. It can be rainy. Unless it's terribly rainy, they won't cancel. But keep in mind a group of community volunteers who are joined, and this was my experience with this wonderful group that we're talking about tonight. These young men and women joined with other members of the community with these kind of tasks. They unloaded and supported food supplies. They packaged and organized food bags. They distributed and helped record the actual distribution to the community. They monitored during this time both pedestrian and vehicular traffic, helped set up the tables, take them down, and clean up in an area that actually sees healthcare patients while all of this is going on. Please keep in the back of your mind, not only were four to 600 cars coming through on every Thursday back in 2020 and onward, but these clinics were running Monday through Friday, as early as 8 in the morning to as late as 7 p.m. on certain days. Medical, dental, lab, radiology work was all going on while hundreds of cars were being directed through a parking lot, given food, and sent on their way. This effort would not have happened without the young men and women that were contracted through Conservation Corps of North Bay by Marin County. That was my first personal introduction. I don't think I've ever been so impressed at what a seamless operation and good humor I had a chance to observe. As a member of the um, Marin Law Library Board, one of our strongest desires has been to introduce to the community groups and organizations that can be of help to them. If this is the first time you're hearing about the Conservation Corps and you know a young man or woman who could benefit from an exposure to a group like this, may I encourage you to direct them to the video that will be available after tonight. This can be found on our YouTube station for the Marin County Law Library. We'll make this available on our website, and we'll, of course, make this available to the Conservation Corps. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Anastasia directly, thank her for her time, and ask her to tell us about this remarkable organization that she has the good fortune to represent. We're glad you're here. We thank you for your time, and welcome. Thank you, Denise. That, that's quite an intro. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And it's just, it's so nice to hear um, your first experience encountering our, our crews in the field. And um, that's one of the things that we recognize when, when, when doing talks like these or various ones we do throughout the area is that if we start just prodding a little bit, we can see that many people in the community have had some experience with our crews, whether they've seen them out working, um, or worked alongside them like you did, um, but very few folks actually have, just from that one experience, the, the full understanding of everything that our program does. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come speak to the group 
um, and talk about that a little bit, especially as Denise mentioned that it's um, our 40th anniversary and we're, we're super proud of that. Um, so with that, I will, I will dive in here. So that's why I usually start with this slide. If I'm in a room full of people, I usually ask for the show of hands of who has some familiarity with, with CCMB, which I will now switch to the acronym because it saves time. Um, and there usually are a, a number of folks, whether we're here in Marin or in Sonoma, where we expanded back in 2010. Um, but um, I usually start with that just to get a feel for the room. So thank you for setting us up that way, Denise. So um, from there, uh, I like to dive in and just say, the, the, what we always lead with is we are a job training and placement program. Because uh, often when you're seeing young folks out in the community doing work like, like this, um, core member here up in Tiburon uh, doing some, some fire fuel abatement. Um, those core members are out there gaining paid work experience as part of our job training model. So what makes that possible for, for us and is a significant portion of how our program is funded is fee-for-service partners like the County of Marin, the Town of Tiburon, Marin Water, um, comparable agencies up in Sonoma County, um, hiring our crews to do work on public lands that they are already planning to do. Um, we'll go a little bit deeper into what type of work that is, but those, those organizations are hiring our crews to do that work. Um, and they are the ones paying the core member salaries and all the associated costs with that, which is great because um, they recognize that they're investing in the future workforce of, of our region as well. So, when core members first join our program, um, and they are assigned to one of two different uh, tracks of training, um, so that um, they're the folks that Denise was working alongside with, which are actually our zero waste crew, and I'll talk about them in a moment. Um, and then there are also our natural resources crews um, that do a lot of the trail work, fire fuel reduction, um, as part of gaining their paid work experience. And while they're with us, they're also um, they're getting the skills, they're learning how to show up on time, they're earning certifications, getting help with job placement, and I'll dive a little bit more deeply into that next. So starting with that natural resources training track, this is where the majority of our core members are because uh, it's where the most significant amount of work is available for our crews to perform in, in our communities. So we have partners, like I mentioned before, um, in addition to those, um, we're doing a lot of work with our, our fire departments and, and the new Joint Power Authority that's helping prevent wildfire within the county, as well as the National Park Service, because we're fortunate to have um, national parks here in our county. But these partners are hiring our crews to do this type of work. So fire fuel reduction, working on trails, some really great habitat restoration projects, that we've done out at Fort Baker, uh, which is a, a beautiful backdrop to go visit a crew in if anyone is ever interested. But um, we do habitat restoration there, removing invasive species, planting lupin, which is really great for the mission blue butterfly. And so the core members are out there doing this work that our partner agencies have already planned on and at the same time learning about why they're doing it um, and just getting skills that they can apply to their future careers. So. You can see here in this photo, this core member is actually working out at the Hamilton Wetlands where we're working on a, um, a long-term habitat restoration plan there. So other types of work these crews do, creek maintenance, flood prevention, which is kind of hard to think about now when we're in severe drought, but usually severe floods follow severe drought. So we do a lot of work around that. Um, and we also contract with um, Caltrans um, through the County of Marin to do a lot of the vegetation management and litter abatement around our highways and freeways throughout the county. So those crews accomplish a lot. So at any given time, um, over the course of the year, we serve approximately 200 young people across both counties. At any given time, we could have, depending on the busyness of the, the schedule, 90 active core members, which is usually in the summertime when there's a lot of work available. Um, and so there are crews all over doing all these different types of work throughout the year. And so you can see here the data that, that talks about the accomplishments that these crews do over the course of the year. So um, hundreds of acres of fire fuel reduction. It feels like this number goes up every year. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, they feel like Sisyphus a little bit when they're doing their fire fuel reduction, but we know that we're protecting a lot of lands and doing important work on doing that. 
um, restoring the habitat, working on a lot of trails through Marin County parks. Um, this photo here is actually of a brand new park up in Sonoma County near Monterio. It's a, a tract of land that was added to the Sonoma County Regional Park System just in the past year. And core members are, are starting to prepare that for public use, which is super exciting. So um, we just now wrapped up our, our most recent fiscal year. So we will have new numbers here about the impacts on our community and environment coming up in the next month or so. Uh, but these numbers are based on the last fiscal year. So our mighty zero waste crew. So um, these are our core members that help with all the, the different types of recycling work that we do throughout the community. And the model of this team's a little bit different. Uh, they're primarily funded through a significant grant that we receive through CalRecycle every year that essentially pays our crews to do uh, the collection of a variety of different types of materials for recycling. So under that contract is the traditional bottles and cans. Um, you've probably seen our core members if you've gone to any event, specifically the Marin County Fair, uh, which just wrapped up at the beginning of this week. Our crews were there doing all of the, um, the waste management when it comes to recycling, composting, and, and garbage. So making sure people were putting things in the right bins, making sure there wasn't any litter around, um, collecting all of that and getting it back to our facility for sorting and sent on for recycling. They did that for the whole fair, so they're very tired. Um, but so bottles and cans are, are a lot of significant um, way that the core members are doing work collecting those, not only at events, but throughout our public lands too. There are a number of different routes that our, our crews from the zero waste team um, drive throughout this every day, basically, um, at different parks. You'll see some of our recycling bins. We're starting to replace them with these nifty new blue ones that we received um, funding for. So you'll see those out at, um, at IVC at the sports fields at Indian Valley College. You'll see them out at Point Reyes at the Visitor Center. Um, so recycling routes from parks and different public lands across both counties, we collect from there as well. Um, and then electronics, e-waste is probably the, the largest, if we're thinking about pounds, that e-waste is probably the most significant material that we collect every year. And the core members need specific, specific, special certifications to be able to handle it because there are different components in there that they know how to need to know how to separate. Um, so we host a lot of events throughout the community. You can go to our website and look at our events calendar to see where they'll be next if you are looking to uh, find a, a proper place to recycle your e-waste. And specifically here in Novato, uh, we have a partnership with um, the Novato Sanitary District where even individuals can call to ask just for an individual pickup at their home and business a couple days a week. We're available to come do that. So it's a really great partnership we have with them. Um, we also collect tires for recycling. Uh, mattresses are a new, a new material that we added a couple of years ago, and that's through a different partnership through um, the Mattress Recycling Council, which I never knew existed until, <laughs> until they came knocking on our door and said that they needed people power to uh, be able to collect mattresses for recycling. And what, what I learned about that one is when you buy a mattress, you are paying a fee to make sure that it's properly recycled after you no longer need it. And those fees that are collected are what pay for this type of work to be done. So uh, both at our Novato and our Katati locations um, have different schedules, which are also on our calendar where folks can drop off their mattresses um, for free to be recycled. Um, and a new, a new material for us this year, which falls nicely in line with the story Denise was telling about our work, with the food bank is food recovery. Um, there was legislation that passed a, a couple of years ago, it's SB 1383, and it's all around making sure that edible food, either um, made by producers or at grocery stores sold, um, that it doesn't end up in the landfill. So that it either gets rerouted to folks in need like at food banks, or if it's no longer edible, that it's properly composted. Um, so we have started a pilot project up in Sonoma County with Zero Waste Sonoma. Um, we were awarded a grant for a refrigerated truck, and we are starting to do work up in that area, um, collecting food from different supermarkets and, and other food producers and making sure that it gets um, 
the variety of different organizations that support folks who um, have food insecurity. So whether it's the Redwood Empire Food Bank or some other smaller organizations, um, we're working toward expanding those services in Marin as the legislation is um, broadened. Right now it's just with food producers and distributors, but eventually it'll make its way down to restaurants. Um, fortunately, it'll be a little while because they are struggling to recover after the pandemic, um, but this is a really exciting new opportunity for, for our zero waste crews to learn new skills um, that will help them in their future career. So we're very excited about that. So this team in particular, I'll just do a little aside. When the pandemic first hit, um, you, you would initially think like, why would this group be doing food distribution at, at MCC or, or at the food bank? And it's because um, our other crews were able to go back to work more quickly. So the natural resources crews, uh, fire fuel reduction, that was essential from day one. They were able to go back and find work with our partners pretty quickly, but the recycling crews, um, because so much of their, their work that they do is public facing and interacting with the community, it took much longer for their regular work to be able to come back online. So we went to all of our partners and, and just said, what can we do? Is there any work that's available? And our partners at County of Marin, as Denise had mentioned, um, got creative. Local government can get creative and flexible when they need to, um, and contracted our crews because there's a significant need for manpower to, to make all these, um, to make those systems work. And we had folks that needed to work and wanted to work. So it worked out really well. These crews are excellent at deploying large scale events where they are um, tracking how many pounds of things are going where, directing traffic, customer service skills, talking to folks. So it, it um, was a really great win, win, win for everybody in, in, that, in that time when things were just crazy. So um, these groups, my slide is not progressing. There we go. Um, so you can see they, they get a little scrubby when they've been working with tires and pulling them out of ditches all day. Um, but this group, it's, it's smaller. We probably, out of a current active 90 core members, might have 12 zero waste core members. Um, but they get a lot of work done in a year that you can see here from this, the amount, the, the pounds and, and number of things that they collect for recycling um, are significant. So they divert tons and tons and tons of material from the landfill every year. Um, we don't do the recycling ourselves, but we work with partners that, um, that collect it from us after we've collected it and distributed it and sorted it and made sure that it's recyclable. They go to different partners that make sure that those materials actually get recycled, which is pretty cool. Um, a note on tires, our, our roof in our Novato building, which needed significant, significantly needed replacing a, a number of years ago, um, we were able to actually replace it with material that was made out of recycled tire. So it, it was really exciting. Cal Recycle helped pay for that along with some, some local foundations that helped support it. But it was just, it was cool for our core members to see a roof like that going on the facility that they work out of and knowing that maybe a tire they pulled out of a ravine at some point might have somehow made it into that material. So it's pretty exciting for us. Okay, so that's a little snapshot into the types of work that the core members are doing when they're out in the field. So this is them getting their paid work experience. They're working eight hours a day, four days a week. They work Monday through Friday, getting paid, eligible for benefits um, if they need them. And they're also earning certifications, which we, have over the years, um, recognized are super crucial. Like the experience is great, but actually having a certificate for certain skills that you can learn while in our program um, can really help secure a job and actually secure a higher paying job. We were uh, a part of a, a study that was done a number of years ago about uh, different job training programs like ours and what types of certifications we offer. And actually the group that did the survey tracked specific certifications like through actual participants in our program into their job placement and did the math and determined that some of these actually yield a higher um, rate of pay per hour if that license is there versus if it weren't there. So um, we offer more than 30 
of these skill-based certifications. A number of them are, are industry recognized, which means um, folks that like arborists, things like that. So our, our Sawyer certification is industry recognized. So you can't just say, oh, I've got the certificate. It, it, there's certain criteria that a core member has to accomplish a number of hours working the chainsaw um, for them to earn it. So Sawyer, the um, first aid CPR and our forklift certifications were in the top three that actually resulted in higher pay for core members. So um, we are, we feel great about offering those. We adjust these all the time based on the type of work that we are being offered by our partners um, and what it seems like the core members, what's helping them get work um, once they exit our program. So I've been talking a lot about our core members. So maybe you wanna learn a little bit about who they are, where they come from. Um, so I always like to pause here and just talk about that a little bit. So, um, we serve a, a very diverse population, as you can see um, from the upper left-hand corner of the screen, um, especially in Marin. Um, most of our core members are, um, are Hispanic or Latino. Many are learning English. Many are either immigrants themselves or are from families that recently immigrated. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about additional services that they might require because of, of when what they need when they come into our program. Um, you can see our, our gender split. We always cheer when it tips a little bit more. It seems like every year we have uh, more female core members joining us. Um, the age range will pretty much always be this age range because of the requirements that we have. We are certified by the state of California to be a local conservation corps. And there's certain requirements, age requirements and things like that of those that we serve that we have to stay within. So um, that is ages 18 to 25. Um, we, we can go above 25, and you can see that we do from, from how the split looks there at, at the age of entry, um, but those don't count toward our certification. So either way, you can see that young people that enroll in our program skew younger. Um, you can see most of them when, when they've, they've come to us um, have, aren't working or maybe haven't had a job um, to date. Um, most come from a low income background. Many need to complete their high school diploma still. And a lot of that um, has to do with different societal barriers that they've had a challenge to overcome. Um, many have had to choose between work and school if their family was in a specific situation. Um, many of our Marine Corps members, even if they had a diploma um, where um, many have actually come from Guatemala. So say they got their diploma in Guatemala, the units don't necessarily transfer here and they need to start over. Um, so there are some significant barriers to achieving financial independence for, for the young people when they join our program. Um, but I always like to have my, my positive slide in the lower right-hand corner is that they're joining because they want, they need help and they want the help to overcome those barriers because they, they want to improve their skills once they've, they've come to us. So. Um, that's an important question for us to ask. We want to make sure that they want to be there um, while they're joining our program. So to help with some of those barriers that I was just mentioning, we have a whole other side of our programming um, of wraparound services. So um, the, the first largest barriers you could see where more than half of our members when they join us still need to complete high school is accomplishing that. So we do that through our partnership with the John Muir Charter School. They specialize in working with adult learners. And this is another um, benefit that we have of being a certified core is um, because we meet the criteria for that certification, we're able to offer a full high school diploma for folks who aged out of the traditional high school system. So you can be 20 and join CCNB and get a high school diploma versus a GED. Um, John Muir specializes in working with organizations like ours that are serving an older population. And we have campuses both at our San Rafael location um, and our Katadi location. And we also um, are the nonprofit partner for a standalone school of John Muir's up in Santa Rosa. So um, because core members when they join us, some, some might need 10 units, some might need 100 units. Uh, they all work with their teachers and have specialized plans to accomplish those goals. 
Um, as I mentioned, a lot of our core members, especially in Marin, um, when they come to us need to learn English first. So that makes it even more tricky and um, a little bit more of a challenge. Usually those core members stay in the program a little bit longer. Um, the program is designed for a year, but on average, young people stay with us probably up to 14 months, depending on what their needs are. So um, through the, the school partnership that we have, and it's on site, which is great. Um, so on that Friday, when they're not working, um, those that need to complete school are, are in, in classroom full time on Friday, and they do work um, towards on their own, um, on their own time as well for some of the, the assignments that they can do, they can do on their own self-paced. So we help them accomplish those goals. Um, if they need to learn English while they're doing it, we work with them on that too. We're, we're really fortunate to have um, some great partnerships and outside funding sources that are helping us bolster what John Muir can offer um, when it comes to English language learning. Um, and we're, we've been implementing that over the past year or so. So um, one of the things that we're doing in that way is working with um, Dominican University because they have a fantastic credential program. And uh, students in that program need to do their service learning hours. And so we've met with Dominican and asked them to refer um, those in their credential program that are gonna be working with bilingual students to come do their service hours with us. And so we're, we're working on getting that implemented this year. So the other big piece, so we call this the glue. The, the glue of our program is our Career Pathways program. So where our um, fee-for-service partners and our, all the municipalities and then the different government agencies that hire our crews um, to do that work are paying for that portion of the program. The Career Pathways program part of the program is the wraparound services and that's supported through contributed income. So we have a nice balance for our whole funding model. Um, so this piece is um, our small but mighty career pathways team. And we have a separate team in, in each county because uh, there are different needs um, for our core members in each county. Um, that from enrollment into the program all the way to job placement and follow-up, they've got the same team that's supporting them. So um, when they enter the program, they have their initial assessment with their um, career pathways coach. Um, that helps them set their goals, determine uh, what kind of career interests they have, um, offer workshops if they're not sure what they wanna do, um, figure out what barriers they might have to overcome. Transportation can be a big barrier. Um, childcare can be a challenge too. Um, we basically wanna help with those as much as we can, or we refer out to other agencies that, that specialize in some of those services so that we can ensure that a core member can stay in the program and get the full benefit of it um, and, not, and not bounce out early, which some do. Um, we're not gonna pretend like everyone joins and is successful all the way through, but we do have some great success rates that I'll talk about in a moment. But that Career Pathways team does follow them all the way through their path um, at CCNB. And they do it through all these different types of, of services. So workshops where they learn um, soft skills, um, interview skills, how to do a resume, um, how to problem solve, all these different kind of soft skills that many of us also need to learn by feel, but we didn't necessarily have all the barriers to employment in the first place. So we try to provide all that to our core members while they're with us. Um, and just digging more into what their interests are, what are their career paths, what, what are there certain certifications or other things that are required by a career path of their choice that we don't offer and how can we help them get access to that. So um, this is also where if the need should arise um, for any kind of legal support, um, it would be this team that would refer core members out to different programs that could potentially help with that. But so far I think we've, we've needed to do it from time to time, but um, it's not an ongoing challenge. So it all depends. Um, it's probably a good spot to to mention that our core members, we are continually enrolling. So uh, we might have core members right now who are getting ready to complete the program and start a new job. But in the same day, we might be onboarding five or six new ones. So we're continually working with young people that are in different phases of their um, career development um, and working their way through the program. And we balance that with knowing how much work we have planned with our partners that hire our crews. So it's a big, big thing to manage, but we keep it in balance pretty well. 
Um, so uh, this team also so follows core members all the way through, helps them with job placements, um, and even follows up afterwards. So we have systems in place where we follow up with core members for um, up to two years after they've exited the program just to make sure that they're happy where they are. Do they need more support? Sometimes you can be working toward a job and you land there and you're there and you're like, what am I doing here? This is not right for me. So we, we, we help um, navigate that if that's a challenge for them. And then the outcomes. So um, with all that work that, that happens throughout the year, both, both on the part of our staff, but also on our core members, um, we have some pretty great outcomes that uh, we continually watch. We have a really spectacular um, evaluations team. We have two, two, a small but mighty evaluation team that tracks all the data that I've been sharing today. So whether it's the, the, the pounds of bottles and cans that we, that we collect to everything about our core members while they're on their journey with us. Um, and so we collect that information, not only to be able to share it with folks like you and our partners and our funders, but also to help guide our work. Um, it's helped us analyze our data over time to determine what core member success looks like, um, knowing that that's different for every core member. Um, there are different gauges that we watch over time. We look at our data three or four times a year to make sure it's still stable. And if something doesn't look right, we all talk about it as a group and look to see if maybe we need to adjust our program or if something's happening there. But we've, we've got it down to a pretty good system. Um, and you can see here from the outcomes that our core members are, are, are doing really well once they exit the program. So um, they're earning on average at least three certifications before they go. Um, nearly 80% when, when they complete CCNB are in living wage employment or continuing on into a different training program or back to school if their, their goal is college. Um, and their wages after placement are just, they're, they're great. If you think about that a young person comes to us when they aren't working at all or might not have ever had a job. Um, when they're with us, they, we pay higher than minimum wage. Uh, we stay ahead of that and make sure that we, starting wages go up every year as, as the state keeps um, bumping up the living wage or the minimum wage, which we agree with, but we just have to budget for it. Um, so they, they make decent money when they're with us, but our goal is to make sure that they can move on the money that they make when they exit. And, and we're, we're accomplishing that. So we're pretty proud of that. So I thought I would take a moment just to talk about a couple of core members because we're, we're looking at lots of broad information, lots of broad data, um, but just a couple stories about <laughs> individuals just so you can see how the impact of the program is, um, is affecting the young folks that are, that are enrolled. So um, Emily's currently in our program. Um, she's on our zero waste crew and she has been with us, I wanna say a little bit less than a year. Um, so she works out of our Novato office. I don't talk about that one too much, but that's where our recycling team works out of here in Marin. So we have the San Rafael location, our Novato location, and our Katati location. Um, so Emily works out of uh, Novato, and she came out as a leader pretty quickly after joining. So she's one of our core members who, who's working on her English language skills, and she's become a leader among um, her team and her crew and her classmates, um, not only showing how quickly her skills are improving, um, but encouraging others to do so as well. Um, she pretty quickly uh, advanced into assistant crew leader position um, and is earning certifications left and right. So a, a funny story is I was, was meeting with, with a community member and we could see out the window of the office that we were sitting in. And I'm telling him about it's, you couldn't have planned it. So I'm telling him about all the certifications that, that core members can earn. And he looks out the window and he sees Emily on the forklift moving a mattress um, that someone had, had dropped off and she's taking it back to the warehouse. And so he just stopped, like he interrupted me. He's like, is she driving a forklift? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, is she okay doing that? We're like, yeah, we don't let them do that by themselves until they've gotten the certification. Um, but it was, it's just, it's, it's nice to see because we see it every day from a staff standpoint, but to have a community member there just seeing a young person and particularly a woman um, wrangling a mattress with a forklift was, was pretty cool. So we also talked to her a little bit afterwards. We went and took a tour of, of the facility and um, she was great. I mean, she, 
it, it takes a lot of courage for our core members to talk to, to strangers and we only ask them to if they're comfortable doing it. But um, she just shared about her experiences here um, and that really one of her goals is to become a crew supervisor, a staff person at CCNB. So um, we will help her toward that. Um, we're, we're really proud to say that a good number of our staff actually are former core members um, and from like across almost every department and different levels of staff all the way up to management positions. So um, we're really proud that for some of those positive outcomes, it's, it's core members who came up through our program that wanna to continue to work here and help others come up behind them. So we're pretty proud of that. So that's Emily's story. And then Michael. Michael is another fantastic success story. So um, he actually joined us right at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> So he joined us in March 2020 um, and was another, another one of the young people in our program who just really quickly started taking on leadership positions, um, pretty quickly became an assistant crew leader. Um, he worked actually on both sides of our training track, so in our natural resources uh, department as well as our zero waste. Um, he continued to grow, started to um, get more skills, was trained into a driver position so that he could actually do some of the driving for the routes, collecting some of the recyclables, um, also earning a bunch of certifications along the way. And um, we're happy to report that actually it was just a couple of months ago, um, he secured a really great job through Clean Harbors, uh, which is a new partnership of ours. Um, they're a company that uh, specializes, it's a waste management company, like we, we honestly struggle to find um, good solid pipelines into, no pun intended, but into the waste management, um, more on the recycling side into that type of career. And we're starting to, to work through some of those, but Clean Harbors is one of our newer partners where they specialize in the handling of hazardous waste and making sure that it's properly disposed of. And they um, hired Michael and actually his buddy, Victor, there, who's also in the photo. That, that's their after photo. They were very proud to take in front of one of our recycling trucks. But um, it's just Michael's a, a great story of someone who, who took a little longer with us. He was with us for about two years before um, finding really what he wanted to do. But he, he worked through our program. There are opportunities for, as I mentioned, um, different roles, like leadership roles within the crew. Uh, you can um, earn raises as well for accomplishing specific goals. And he just took every opportunity and just was invested in himself. And could be that if it, if it weren't for COVID, he might've come through the program sooner, but I'm kind of happy that it took him a little while because we only recently developed this relationship with Clean Harbors and it's a really great success story for him. So, um, these are just a smattering of the different uh, companies and agencies that have hired our core members. And one of the things that you can see is a common thread going through is you might recognize some of the logos from some of the partners from previous slides is uh, partners who hire our core members to do work um, on specific projects while they're at CCNB often hire our core members permanently as staff as well. So it's like the best, long-term, real-life, real-time job interview ever for our core members because they're out there working alongside folks at the National Park Service. Um, we have a core member, oh, I should have put him in there too, but we had a core member who um, was with us for a long time, became a crew supervisor, joined CCNB staff for a couple of years, and he just now got hired at the National Park Service and then the GGNRA. So, um, the young people in our program have a tremendous opportunity to be near folks that can potentially hire them. And it just shows in, in the number of different agencies that do hire our core members once they exit. So because, because we are who we are, <laughs> um, we're always looking to see how we can responsibly grow and do more for the young people in our, our program and also our communities because of all the work that they do while they're being trained also benefits our communities in so many different ways. So we, in the past year, started thinking more about what, what other, what's the next step? So right now we actually, this is our working title, we're calling them our next step program, so we don't have a good name for them yet, but that might stick. 
Um, there are, we've gotten really good in 40 years. Um, as Denise mentioned, we're in our 40th anniversary of preparing young people for um, really great entry level living wage careers to get them on their way. Um, but we wanna do more and, and still staying within our mission, we see that there are opportunities around us where there are different types of careers that require more significant training um, that the young people that we work with might never have had access to. So our wanting to do that coincided with um, Marin County Fire Chief Jason Weber's simultaneous dream to work to diversify the fire service. So um, that months and months and months of work and planning and working with partners across the whole county have resulted in this new program um, you might have heard about, you might not because it's brand new, it just started in January called the Fire Foundry. And so Fire Foundry is a, a cross-sectoral partnership if we want to get technical of um, different organizations coming together with the goal of providing a career pathway for young people into the fire service that are traditionally not represented there at all or never thought that they could become a firefighter or work in the fire service. So um, CCNB is a proud founding partner of that. Um, the program is designed to provide, it's a four-step program that has young people um, spend a whole year working alongside Marin County Fire doing fire fuel reduction and getting to know just how that whole world works. And that's the part that CCNB is involved in. Um, they're also going to school at College of Marin, who's another great partner in this, in this whole consortium that um, they're earning their credits in different units that they're going to need both to join the Firefighter Academy, but by the end of this first year, they'll also have their EMT. And then it progresses from there where they're, um, they move into the Fire Academy, they're getting really great um, education on new fire technology that's being developed at Cal and Stanford. So those are a couple of our other partners. Um, and the whole goal is to partner a young person with someone in the fire service to mentor them all the way through from this first step to the fire academy to seasonal work to permanent work. So um, we just launched that this year and are looking at other similar programs um, in Sonoma County with the Watershed Research Training Center, we're doing some fire training there that could blossom into a fire foundry Sonoma. Um, and also working um, with an ecological restoration company, Hanford, on their new nonprofit training model to, to train the next ecological workforce. So you might have seen this on Open Road with Doug, Doug McConnell a couple times. He's, he's featured this program on the show where um, Hanford is very keen to train the next workforce when it comes to ecological restoration. So not just out there doing the work, but learning, learning why the work is being done and learning all the different types of skills that are more elevated than what we can offer at CCNB. So we're working closely with them on developing a similar model to Fire Foundry, but for an ecological workforce. So stay tuned for more on that because it's all, it's all in the works right now. Um, so as I'm, I want to leave time for questions if that's how it works, but I just have a couple more things um, here locally in Marin. I'm not sure if everyone on the call is from Marin, but we um, have some events coming up um, that are supporting Conservation Corps North Bay. Um, there's a, a, just a small fundraiser in Novato coming up in a couple of weeks that's very casual um, at Launcher Lines. But we absolutely want to make sure that if people can attend our high school graduation coming up in September, um, that everyone is welcome to that. It's such a, a huge milestone for the young people in our program. Um, one of the biggest barriers that we help them remove um, is their um, success in education. We're hosting our first in-person graduation for the first time um, since 2019. So um, save the date for that September 17th. It'll be at the JC up in Petaluma. Um, at that auditorium there. So with that, I leave it with how folks can stay in touch with us. Uh, we're very active on all social media platforms, most social media platforms, we're not on TikTok or anything like that, but most of the standard uh, social media platforms. Um, and folks can also sign up for our e-newsletter on the homepage of our website if they would like to. So um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's hard because I can't see faces, so I don't know if 
people have questions or how folks are responding, but that is CCD in a nutshell. May I ask one question? If a young Absolutely. man or woman is listening to this tonight, what are the first steps to applying to join this organization? What do they do? Um, they can, there are a couple different things they can do. If, if they have technology, they can go to our website and click on the become a core member header and apply right there from the website. Um, if, if that is a little bit more of a challenge, they can walk into any of our offices uh, to grab a paper application and submit it that way as well. Um, or they can always just call the, the main line that's also on our website and just ask to talk to somebody because they want to be a part of the program. Pretty much any staff member and probably most core members that a young person could encounter can help them get in contact so that they can apply. Stephen, do we have any questions? Uh, not this. I'll, there's some thank you. I see them. You're welcome. Thank you for yeah, having me. <laughs> Well, I guess, I don't know, not to try to get too personal, but in terms of question, I was just sort of thinking about, like, background-wise, like, was, I don't know, I'm just saying it would be a good opportunity for, sorry, I'm rambling, but, like, say people who are younger end up, you know, even all that sort of thing, that some of the people come from that kind of background, or is there... Yeah, people, you know, we can yeah. serve folks from, from almost any background. It just happens that... Um, the folks that, that we serve hear about us from, from their friends or other folks who, who come from similar backgrounds and, and needed to overcome similar barriers. And they, they say, hey, CCMB is a good place to do that. Um, but we, we've had folks that join us just because they want to get their start in an environmental career. And they have zero experience and they want to get to know what that's like. Okay, thank um, you. We are pretty, we're limited to, at least on the the low end of our age range, we can't serve lower than, than 18, but we do have a lot of relationships with schools and high schools and continuation schools for um, like with their counselors, just to say, hey, if you, if you see a young person who's gonna be turning 18 soon that you think will benefit from our program, send them our way. I'd like to mention something. When I was doing research about the organization, I ran across something that I was really impressed by, and I suspect you can flesh the story out a little bit oh, about okay. um, this. I'm going to quote a gentleman by the name of Dominic Dudley, okay. who made a comment about, I'm not walking down into that creek when it's pouring rain if I don't like you. Yep. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit about an issue that you faced and the way you went about dealing with the question as it arose by this young gentleman. Yeah, and that's that's an excellent scenario to talk through. And I and I know Dominic, so <laughs> he's been he's been <laughs> successfully out of the program for a long time. But it's with any young person, regardless of their background. They need to trust someone who's trying to lead them or tell them to do something. And we ask our core members to work very, very hard under lots of different conditions, whether it's a rainy creek, whether it's a hot day. I mean, we have safety protocols for all those things when work stops or, or how we do breaks and things, but um, it's not easy work. And our supervisors need to be able to themselves perform that work, but also mentor and teach and encourage and inspire the eight core members that they're in charge of that day. So what, what Dominic is talking about is that, that and, and it's what he was alluding to also is he wanted to pursue a career working with young people. And so he, he was looking at things in that way anyway. Um, and he did end up working for um, Santa Rosa City Schools, which is very cool, but um, we can't just be the people who tell them what to do. We need to be the, the human that listens to them and trusts them. And one of the, the things that we've done for several years now, I'd say at, at least close to the four years that I've been here, is really invest in training in our supervisors. So for the longest time, we probably relied on our career pathways team to do the warm and fuzzy emotional, are you okay side. But then looking at how much time our core members spend with their supervisor, they spend more time with that person than anyone else in the company. So we wanted to make sure that 
Now, first that we're hiring folks that want to be there and want to help you, that's important. Um, but finding a unicorn of someone who has the technical skills of working with all these tools and youth development skills is very, very hard. So we definitely hire for technical skills and, and the passion and the alignment with our mission, but what we can train the youth development side. So we've invested in that um, through, through grants from some of our great partners to make sure that our, all of our core member facing staff get regular training um, on youth development, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, trauma-informed care, all these things that can just help them do their job better, um, which in turn will make a better experience for the core members. And Dominic is sassy, but he's great. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great story and I couldn't resist. Thank you. No, I'm glad I, I'm glad I knew the story behind it and the answer. So there you go. <laughs> You made an interesting observation, and when we're working with a, a young person having their first job, ultimately when you look at how a day is shaped, 24 hours, you are spending more time with your colleagues at work than you are with your loved ones. Mm -hmm. Learning to communicate, get along. Um, I really liked that comment about walking into a creek when it's raining if I don't like you. Mm -hmm. um, it's the icing on the cake when we learn those positive things. Yep, for sure. I would like to thank you. If there are no other questions, I would like to um, invite you to send us a link around graduation time in September um, that we could put on Facebook. Absolutely. And Absolutely. we'd like to stay in touch, and we very much appreciate hearing about all the good things we know are going to come from you. And if you would like to provide any information for the library um, in the future, we would love to have it. Super. Yeah, that'd be great. We can figure out what's, what's appropriate to share and, and also just the resources that the library can, can also offer. Um, I think there's, there's a good connection point there as well. So I, I'd like to continue that conversation. Become friends with our with our wonderful law librarian. He's a good <laughs> fellow to know. All right, we've, I, we've been introduced, so we're good. <laughs> I will thank you all and invite you to join us next month. We've had a little bit of a scheduling change. We're fortunate to be having um, the new director of the Self Help Legal Center. So, talk about an organization that really does reach out and um, help people every month. Um, and once again, we're reminded of just how lucky we are here in Marin County to have the resources that we do and the ideas to build on new ones. Um, I would invite all of you to come back, catch us on YouTube, but thank you again for supporting both this wonderful organization that joined us tonight and the Marin County Law Library. Have a safe week. Thank you. Thanks all.